Uh, welcome to USAR 2021. Uh, we are truly happy to connect to all of you globally. Uh, this meeting is live stream. Uh, we are very grateful to all our sponsors who make this conference possible. Today's sponsor is our studio. Uh, let me introduce myself. I am Aditi Arupatya, Geospatial Data Analyst at MCAPS in India. Today, we have Binakshi as the keynote speaker for R in Action. Minakshi is an air quality and environmental health researcher from India, currently living in Taiwan. She works on projects based in India and in the US. In 2017, Minakshi co-founded a women-owned uh, consulting organization, Ilk Labs, with a focus on providing reliable data for environmental health projects and education focused on global grant challenges. She is passionate about reproducible research and enjoys teaching R and stats. Minakshi earned an MPH in environmental health from the University of Washington, Seattle in 2015 and an MS in biomedical engineering from the University of Alabama at Birmingham in 2009. Her work on pollution inequities was recently featured in the New York Times. Before we start, requesting all attendees to ask questions and upload questions in the Q&A feature here. Uh, welcome, Manakshi. Over to you. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone who is here. Um, thank you so much for joining. I'm really grateful to user for this amazing opportunity. Today, I'm going to talk about um, how we use R to answer questions about air quality. And uh, much of the work that I will present today is uh, led by Aditi. We are I've just been very fortunate to get a chance to work with her on these projects. Um, so yeah, I'll get started. Okay. So uh, we are a small team, interdisciplinary team, with very different backgrounds from GIS, atmospheric chemistry, environmental health, uh, basic science, and we have all come together to work on air quality projects. The reason I named our talk today, um, Can We Do This in R, is because we all, we've all had uh, very different R journeys, and we are all in very different places, our team, in very different places. Um, we have had no, like many R users, we have had no formal training in R, and we have learned it on the job. And so every time we have a new computational question, we have a new visual visualization challenge. Um, we ask uh, we ask this because we have not done this before. Can we do this in R? And for the past uh, four years that we have worked in R and on these projects, the answer has always been like a resounding yes. Yes, we can do this and we can do more. So this talk is about that, uh, what, um, just a sample of what all we do in R. And yeah, um, so to specifically what we do uh, in, uh, at Ilk Labs is we measure air quality to answer questions like, uh, is one block dirtier than other? Is one season different than other in terms of concentrations? Do low cost instruments or consumer grade instruments, do they answer questions reliably when compared to more expensive reference grade gold standard instruments? And if they don't, can we apply statistical corrections to make the um, measurements more reliable or more informative? Can we adapt cutting edge methods from different contexts, mostly developed country settings, to low or middle income uh, resource settings like India when it comes to monitoring. And we also analyze national level household surveys on energy use, indoor air pollution, and we work on building models for uh, pollutants using different sources of data with satellite and ground data. So I'll, I'll spend the next few minutes in con contextualizing, giving a background on how we collect data that we then analyze in R. So it will be, bear with me with, for some air quality primer. When it comes to measurements, there are two main types of air quality measurements. One is stationary monitoring. So these are two duplicate 
um, high-end sensors installed on a rooftop. And this is typical on how, of how air quality uh, stationary monitors are placed. They measure your ambient air and give the concentration at that particular site. What is becoming more, uh, more and more popular with time now is mobile monitoring, where sensors are placed in a car and then or, or any moving platform, and then they are used to map pollution at street level. So what you see here is a, is a Google Street View car. So these Google Street View cars are the same cars that Google uses for maps, for mapping. Um, your street and some in some countries, some of a uh, few cars from the fleet have these really um, sophisticated air quality instruments fitted on them so that while the street is being mapped, air, air quality on those streets are also being measured. In India, Google Street View cars are not allowed for privacy and security reasons. So we have adapted this technique working with the same team um, for our in Indian settings. This is an example of what a stationary uh, monitoring network looks like. So this is a map of Bangalore where we work, which is in South India, a city in South India. And all these circles, the each circle is one stationary monitor and the color and the number here gives a concentration of a particular pollutant there. So this is what a network looks like, uh, many sensors, distributed all over the city. And if you have enough sensors in a particular region, then it can give a city scale or a micro scale idea of what the pollution like that um, there is. So this is one of our stationary monitoring projects. And this is a schematic of our mobile monitoring projects. So what goes in our uh, the car that carries the sensors. So we have now we are coming to these different data sources that we have to combine together to analyze. So there are different uh, groups of devices. We have portable instruments for uh, air quality, different, each instrument is for a particle or a particular gas. Now, since we are in the air, and since we are moving on a mobile platform, we are, we are collecting spatial data and that spatial information is very important. We have a GPS for location information, we also use probes for weather conditions, to, so to measure humidity in the air because that impacts our readings. That impacts the readings when you're measuring particles especially. So these are all the different instruments that go into the mobile platform. And one of the main products is um, building a street level pollution map like this on the right, uh, which is similar to your Google traffic maps except the color here, instead of traffic, it denotes the level of the pollutant. So the darker street means they are more polluted than the lighter or the blue streets. So what the setup means is that are each, each of these instruments have their own uh, data frame, like they have their own data download method. And from the point of view of analysis, a different data frame um, in a different format, with the timestamps in different format and such um, layers of complexity complexities before we get to analyze them. So this is the inside of our, our move, moving our platforms. It's less uh, less fancy than a, a Google a Street View car, but uh, what we what we have done here is um, used uh, uh, removed the back seat of a car fitted it with these metal shelves and all the instruments that I showed in the previous slide, they're all secured in this blue bin and they have inlets coming out of them, which measure the air that, uh, measure the air and the particles inside. And the laptop, laptop here is used as a logger because all instruments do not log data within, in the instruments, so they need additional laptop. So this is, the, this is our data collection setup and this is how we collect the data that we later analyze in R. So this is what it looks like in practice. We take this car out on the road and make repeat measurements several times. But sometimes it looks like this. So this is an image of one of our roads where we had planned to take the car for measurement. And there is this roadblock, as you can see, the road is dug up, it was uh, it's it's typical. It's a very common site in uh, 
many Indian cities. It's uh, unplanned, unannounced, and we don't know when we would be able to go back on the road. So it is indefinite. So the, all that to say is if you have collected field data, you know that it is complicated. There are many things that are out of control. Um, it can be chaotic. And, but once we have surmounted those and finally painstakingly collected the field data, using R in the next step for data analysis really allows us, allows us real control. And, and the flexibility that R provides um, is just is very, very empowering. So now from here, I will uh, spend, uh, I will show a few slides on packages, our packages that we use, uh, spe uh, specific packages that we use, and uh, what do we use them for? So uh, we all love Tidyverse. <laughs> so for all our data cleaning tasks, uh, we use many Tidyverse packages and for plotting as well. Um, we have, um, as you saw, the different sources of data in the mobile monitoring platform. They all have um, timestamps. And so it's very useful to use reader and read underscore CSV functions to read, read those in because it automatically parses the time, uh, date time objects. So you don't have to specify separately that this is not a character and it's a date time column. So that's very uh, super useful. Um, ggplot for all our, uh, that's our first go-to for all our visualization plotting tasks. Then we are always working with a lot of uh, big data. We are collecting high frequency data per second or per minute for many, many, many days. And so uh, using per uh, and map functions instead of the for loop whenever we can uh, makes the analysis more efficient, makes our code faster. So that's very helpful. And beyond Tidyverse, there are some packages that we have, um, we find particularly useful for our analysis. So first is um, consistent timestamps using Lubridate. So we have, um, we have our data from different devices. And our first step is to match them together, to join the data sets together based on the timestamps. So the location data with the pollutant, with the pollutant data and with the weather data. Now for this, the timestamps need to be consistent so they can be matched. Um, there are, uh, so the timestamps could be of different formats. Uh, they're just based on um, device manufacturer preferences. Sometimes the, timestamps are in different time zones. And that's because that depends on sometimes where the machine, where the instrument is manufactured, or some uh, manufacturers prefer, prefer just UTC standard time. So it is different from the Indian standard time that we would be using or would be counting on for analysis. So for all of this Lubridate, the fun some functions in Lubridate are really, really intuitive. Uh, for us, uh, for example, parsing date times with the YM, YMD underscore HMS set of commands. If you have not used this before, it's year, month, day, underscore, hour, minute, seconds. And there are several, all permutations and combinations of this. Uh, it can, you can be uh, used and they are quite intuitive because this order represents what your input is in. Assigning time zone with, with underscore TZ is also Super helpful. So we use Lubridate all the time to um, for timestamp manipulation before we join our data sets. Next is something that makes our life very easy is uh, using the janitor package for uh, cleaning up column names. So this is um, we I have a before and after here. So these are column names of a data set uh, before, before using the package. So this is, a, this is again an air quality data set um, that we received. And this is um, elevation. You can see elevation month season. These column names are really descriptive, which is great. PM 2.5 daily mean, PM 2.5 11 hours, uh, 14 hours, 10 to 14 hours. So 
the, these are not bad column names. They're very descriptive and if from this point of view of English, like they're understandable. But when you start typing in these um, as variable names or column names, you see some inconsistencies. For example, there is dash, there is dash and a gap here. Then there are uh, capital letters and small letters. And then there is, again, gaps, again, gaps and dash. And then uh, many column names starting with uh, digits instead of um, alphabets. So I can load the janitor library and then just ask to clean names. And, and this, is, this is what happens after that. So by default, it will clean up all the names as in convert them consistently to a snake case. So all lower cases separated by underscore, all the gaps are gone, all the dashes are gone, they are all replaced, any separation is replaced with underscore. So this is just more consistent and when you're calling each column, it's just more um, systematic than um, to include in analysis. Next, um, we use Plotly a lot for uh, to make interactive plots. So ggplot is the default. Uh, here I have an example of ggplot and then what happens if we use Plotly after that. So I have a simple ggplot time series object. It's called plot1 here. Um, I'm sorry about very fine font, but stay with me. The y axis here is time. It's uh, sorry, x axis here is time. It's a time series and y axis is uh, pollutant concentration. So this is what we get is a useful um, plot, a static plot from ggplot. And if I use plotly, so I've just called library plotly and then wrapped the my ggplot object plot one in ggplotly, which is a function. So that takes in a ggplot object and then converts into interactive plot. So now look, it's the same plot, it's the same information. Now I can scan, I, I, I can click on points and it shows the um, date and BC. So it, it shows more information on that. There's a lot you can do. Um, I can zoom in, I can pan around. So suddenly I have this, very nice interactive plot with just one command. And it's very useful if you're working with, um, again, high frequency data, big data, and you want to do more with a plot. Next set of interactive plotting is uh, making interactive maps with the leaflet package. Um, so let me, I'll just do a quick demo of that. Yes. So this is a this is a sample map of our study area. It's a background of OpenStreetMaps, and on this there is a leaflet map overlaid, and the colors show pollutant concentration. And if I click here, I can click on each point and see what the what the attributes are there. Um, so I have one pollution, pollutant at 72, I have 55% humidity, and then I have this particle concentration. So this is, uh, again, better than a static map. Um, I, can, I can pan, go to a different area, I can zoom, zoom, look at this. So this is just, just so much more increased functionality using the leaflet map. So let's go back here. We also use R for statistical modeling. Um, there are many things we can just do with base R, linear, multilinear regressions with the LM function, logic mod models when you have categorical or binary outputs with GLM, PCA, principal component analysis using PR comp. Um, there are many options for linear mixed effect models. We use the LME4 package more, frequent, uh, more frequently. And then the genera uh, general additive models or GAM models using the GAM package. We have not started exploring tidy models yet, but that's, that's on, our, on our list. 
since we're talking about air quality, uh, there is uh, this one package which is really cool and very helpful called Open Air by Carslo and Rockins. And it's uh, for air quality specific data. There is some really cool uh, visualizations that you can do using that. So this one that we um, make very often, this is called a calendar plot. As you can see, this is a calendar from July, 2019 to February, 2020. And for each day, uh, each box is a single day. And we can see um, this is the color signifies the pollutant concentration. And the arrow here is for the wind direction. So you can see the wind direction and magnitude from the size of the arrow. So this is just like this one single plot is doing a lot of work. And it's just um, really amazing and very informative to use. So if you work in air quality and if you haven't checked out yet, um, definitely check out the open air package. So um, you may uh, you may have figured or you may imagine that in our in this uh, work we do a lot of there are a lot of repeat data analysis tasks. For example, for mobile monitoring, we take a car in a neighborhood and we are um, we uh, map a neighborhood several days um, for um, do many repeat me measurements so that we have all. Um, uh, we have accommodated for all the variations in that neighborhood. So it's one neighborhood measured several on over several different days, many different times. Then we go from one neighborhood to another and then measure that several different times. And so these repeat measurements, so there are these daily measurements that we take and the data analysis tasks are pretty much similar for from one day to another. Um, to, uh, make sure the timestamps are consistent, join the data, plot the data to see if uh, what happened that day, were there any anomalies to quality assurance, quality checks. So to simplify these repeat tasks, we have developed uh, uh, some shiny apps. One is for the mobile monitoring, so the data from multiple monitors. And what this looks like is on the left, you have the option of um, uploading your data from different sources. So for the location data, the pollutant data, the weather data. And once you do that, the app will automatically generate um, a joint file. And not only that, but also a statistical summary and time series plots, maps. So this really um, reduces the computational time from many hours per day to a few clicks per minute. So. Um, this is here is a link for that. It's called MMAQ Shiny. Another uh, app that we have developed for stationary data. So this is called PolyCheck, and it's to facilitate analyzing open source air quality data um, from India and from many other uh, from other global sources as well. So. Uh, once again, you can upload the data uh, and specify data cleaning um, parameters, uh, and it will generate a summary, statistical plots, linear regressions, and many other. And we have also integrated open air, so the calendar plots, you can uh, gen generate those using the open air functional functionalities through this. Um, package as well. So if you have in your area, you have open air data, open air quality data sources, take this for a spin and, you know, definitely give us feedback. And if you want to learn more, please attend Aditi's talk, uh, Elevator Pitch, which is in a few hours and uh, yeah, ask more questions on that and give us feedback. So from data analysis, I just I want to switch gears and talk about um, using R as a workflow tool to organize and share our work. Um, so the first thing, uh, and maybe you already do this, uh, but before we used R, we just like organizing our work in our separate folders on our computers and 
everyone had a different system, but uh, using um, creating an R Studio project for each new project and just each new bundle of analysis has been super helpful. Um, so that's how we start every project and now they're organized like that and using GitHub for version control. And then initiating the GitHub with a readme file, which in the beginning, it contains a project description, file name description. So what are the file naming conventions? Every project may have different naming convention based on the dates on the region and the purpose and other metadata. So once after initializing, we keep the readme file continues to evolve as our analysis involves and as we complete it. So using the R projects version control plus readme, it's really helped streamline our organization. And then reporting with R Markdown. So that has been a really uh, game changer, I think, in terms of if you already use R Markdown, you know um, how useful it is to have it is to have code and outputs side by side um, in facilitating sharing and reviewing by other people who are coding or who are reviewing your results or collaborators um, to for reproducible analysis. You can reproduce an analysis with a click of a button, make few changes and uh, reproduce it again. And different output formats are possible, Word docs, PDF. We, uh, of, of course, HTML format has the, most of the functionalities, so that's really useful. Um, some features that we um, are, are we find particularly nifty uh, for us is just this uh, inline text. So if I want to summarize, uh, include a summary of this is the mean or this is the um, standard deviation of this parameter inside my text and I don't want to um, write it manually but have it computed, I could use the inline text function. So here is, a, if you've not used it, here is a simple, uh, here is an example. So I have this uh, this is this is all code and this is a generated output because this this slide um, show is also um, R Markdown document. So um, this is all code and output here that you are seeing. So I have assigned A is two, and I want to say I have a number of cats and a plus one number of dogs, and I include those expressions in this codes along with R, and then. Um, our markdown knows to evaluate that code. So I have, it will, this is the output. So this is what you type as you code and your R markdown report output will have two cats and three dogs, which is which has taken the value from A and this from A plus one. So if you include an expression, it will be evaluated like that. And, and in your final report, it just looks like plain text, but it's just like such a clever thing that if you want to include a number which has been computed and don't want to type it, changes, this is this very nifty. Another aesthetic feature, which uh, is really cool, is just having a um, table of contents and, and then a floating table of contents. So it's just with just uh, these two commands, TOC is true and TOC float is true. I'll just give you a demo here. So this is a report with, uh, with floating table of content. By floating, I mean as as you go further down the report, the your table of content stays with you. So you can actually use it to navigate through the report, no matter how long the report is. So that is very useful. Um, and then something else that we have been playing around with a little bit is remember our stationary map of um, Bangalore low cost sensors. Um, so this is, um, we have around 40 plus sensors and for each sensor we have to um, very frequently every few weeks or monthly, we have to generate diagnostic reports like is the sensor healthy or is it, is it data reliable? So that just that means data cleaning, analysis, plotting some time series, regression, um, comparing it with reference regression. And the analysis looks the same for all of um, whichever sensor you choose, the analysis will be the same. Um, so we are playing around with the idea of using parameters using the um, each sensor as a parameter and then generating individual diagnostic reports using a single R markdown file um, 
So if that that works, that will be that will again really simplify the analysis. So that's uh, all today for the analysis part. Um, I'm really excited to share with you what this the final part of the talk, which is stuff that we have learned from the R community. And these are the things that, you know, we did not set out to learn these lessons, but we are so glad that we did because it has really, I think, improved our work for the better and just our approach for the better. So first lesson is just, you know, importance of community. Like today, if anyone asks me if, um, if they're on the fence about R and would, would learning R be worth it or should I spend time? And I, you know, I, my usual response is, it's definitely, um, it's worth your time. Uh, it, you won't feel that the time is wasted. Uh, but, uh, and also, our community is amazing, so you should definitely learn art for that, for the community. And five years ago, if someone had told me that you learn this technology because our community is amazing, I would not have been able to relate to that because that's just like, that's just two different things. That were two different things in my mind that I couldn't connect. Like, I just, I want to make cool plots uh, and I want to learn the statistical method so I can use it in this paper. Um, I don't know. I, I I don't know about this community aspect. I can't relate to that. But uh, that could not be further from the truth today. Um, just the community, uh, and and you know, you all all of you are attending here who are part of our community. So thank you, thank you for that. And it's just um, it's just the support and encouragement that we have received from um, the R community has been amazing. And when I said in the beginning that we learned everything on the job in terms of R, I think the other thing is also that we learned many things from the community, just many techniques, many approaches, things to think about, and we are just so grateful. Whether it is the Our Lady Slack channels, when you're stuck, you post a question and there's so many helpful responses, um, the minorities in our user community, which is just amazing and encouraging. And if you identify as a minority in R, please definitely consider joining this amazing community. Um, the book clubs, the meetups, the Tidy Tuesdays, and the and the code of sharing um, the norm of sharing your code um, is uh, that's just like such a good spirit. And we all share that now, and uh, we've learned so much, so much from that. So that's an amazing, very invaluable lesson that we have learned. Um, second lesson is using artwork for teaching. So when we think of data science or even like air quality, that and artwork, it just doesn't fit together, at least, you know, in my mind, it didn't used to. But uh, now I have, um, now our, my mind has changed, our mind has changed, and um, the main inspiration for that comes from Dr. Alison Host's work uh, and her, you know, amazing, <laughs> fuzzy, delightful R monsters and her artwork in uh, for beginner concepts as well as like really uh, sophisticated concepts like. Uh, clustering and statistical analysis and all of this are just uh, so useful in making not just learning but also teaching R and just making it so much more friendlier and more fun and more um, accessible so this this has been very very inspiring for us I also want to give a shout out to the teacup giraffes project uh, by Wallum and Leon um, the link is right here. Um, in their own words, it's a delightful series of modules to learn statistics and R coding for students, scientists, and stats enthusiasts. And it's it's truly, truly del delightful. So they start, if you're not familiar with this, they start with these cute giraffes measuring their length on each of these two islands and then looking at the differences of populations. So through, through like these... Um, through this uh, kind of storytelling, they um, 
they in gently introduce distribu um, basic concepts like distributions, population distribution, standard error, um, ggplot. And uh, so if you are, if you're a beginner yourself, or if you're looking to teach beginners, please definitely um, uh, check, check this resource out. So examples like this, like they have made our learning fun our our learning fun and as well as really uh, made us think about how to push this envelope of teaching and making it less dry when it comes to R and stats and you know a bit more friendlier. So that's that has been great. And the third lesson is uh, this open source and collaboration. Uh, so how to operate in this ecosystem and, you know, like how to think about sharing code and making, making that col collaboration, um, less painful and less painful and easier by following some coding practices. Um, so again, this is what we try to follow, uh, to make, um, coding practices easier. And if you have more insights of their stuff, their stuff that you do, I would love to hear that in chat. Um, so using projects and version first, like I mentioned, uh, version control for organizing and really, really exhaustive descriptive readme files. So if people read them, especially in this pandemic situation, when you are not there to explain many times and people are working in time inconsistent manner, having that readme file that is exhaustive to handhold someone new is uh, has worked well. Then um, just coding, like following tidyverse style guide for code. So your code looks consistent, it's easier to understand and consistent naming with functions and objects and commenting, commenting code for yourself and commenting code for others, for our collaborators where, uh, and definitely explaining the why of the code, like why did we do this analysis and why did we do that analysis when we did that one? And especially when we are adding new packages into uh, code, when um, the new packages and new libraries that are function um, uh, task specific. So just com commenting that what that library is for. And last but not the least, not hard coding file locations. So no file locations, which says like my C drive and my computer and my folder inside the code, because that will not work on someone else's computer. So using relative file paths um, with the package here, um, that's been, that has really simplified this uh, using relative file paths in the code. Um, so these are some practices. I won't say that every code on my computer right now follows this, but at least before we share it with others, we try to go through this checklist to see that all of this um, is satis uh, satisfied. In terms of what next, uh, we have uh, we have a this is some things from our list. So uh, one thing we want to do is uh, a book down project to organize um, all of our field protocols and code project wise. So for uh, each project, this has been um, kind of this ambitious project that we have, um, I think we are working towards so so that like we can bundle, bundle it in a way that if you know next, another group wants to work on mobile monitoring, we, we, you know, we could just transfer this, do this knowledge transfer in a way that it is, um, can be well followed. And we do want to explore tidy models as we get more into modeling and machine learning for uh, building air quality models. And um, the third thing that uh, this is, I've written it as a bullet point, but it's more like a reminder for all of, all of us, uh, our team, uh, that is thinking about accessibility. This has um, definitely been a blind spot and really it's the interactions with the R community on Twitter and Slack that has sensitized us to this, um, to think more and to, you know, to, uh, to have considerations for accessibility in our workflow. So uh, for this presentation, I've tried to add all text in the um, images. If they don't work for you, please let me know because I would like to definitely like to correct that. And that's like, uh, this would be a work in progress, but we would like to, be conscious and start thinking about that now. 
So with that, uh, I would like to um, acknowledge the resources that I've used for this presentation. Um, sharing in and sharing in extra. Sharing in extra has some really cool features like the tab sets and uh, tile views and uh, really adds a lot of functionalities to sharing in um, all the images and the one like on the side, uh, the background images are from raw pixel, which uh, the, that are publicly available. And the logos in the schematics are from the noun project. And this is a creative commons project and these um, are publicly available. I would also like to thank our research partners and funding collaborators without whom the work would not have been possible. And yeah, with that, I, I leave you with this image of what it feels like to be a part of the supportive R community. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Minakshi, for the wonderful talk. I have a few questions lined up. Uh, the first question is by David. Can you give some examples of research questions that you have been able to answer with R? Yeah, so some of the, yes. So some of the questions that, um, one thing that we wanted to ask is, um, you saw those stable, the maps that we are, I'm calling stable maps. Um, so one, one thing was that we wanted to know how many drives in a neighborhood is enough to make reliable, reliable, stable maps that capture most of the variation. So that's, that's one thing. I think that's one of the first questions that we uh, wanted to ask. And that, so we did that using R. It involves, it involves first taking a data sets of say 30, dri 30 drives in, in a neighborhood. And then you take two drives and three drives and 10 drives and see if they match with the 30 drive data set. And so it involves sampling and resampling. And so all of that work, um, we did that in R and that like I, the answer, the answer is just like in research, there's never a definite answer, but you get some answers and more questions. So uh, the answer was, it depends on the neighborhood and depending on the variation in the pollution, um, the number of drives that you need will change. Yes, thank you. Um, the next question is, how often do you update the stationary data for its shiny app? So for the shiny, oh, the stationary data. So the stationary data, we don't collect that data. That uh, for the uh, shiny app, that uh, data is publicly available already. Um, so it, speaking of those, speaking of the, those collective platforms, it depends on who is putting out the data. Sometimes the federal agents, and depending on the type of monitor, um, sometimes uh, most, of, most of it these days is, is real near real time. So it's every day or every, every few hours. But if it's uh, uh, depending on the technique, sometimes the older monitors, which are not real time, the data can be updated on in a matter of days or yeah, uh, in a matter of days. Okay, um, so thank you. The next question is by Arnold. Uh, you are working with several people at, in this project. How do you organize uh, that you all work in the same way and how do you use GitHub in collaboration? Who and when uh, do, uh, does the check in the GitHub? Uh, happen. So um, it, I think it looks like, oh, actually we are not many people. So we are actually a very small team. <laughs> so in terms of the people who do coding is really like right now is three of us who are, who are doing coding. So it's not, uh, we're doing, so it's like, yeah, it's like a small team that's doing a lot. Um, so we use uh, GitHub not in the beginning towards the later later end when we are when one of us is like say hey i'm done with this analysis and um i think i've checked everything do you want to check if this runs the same way on your computer so that's when we use github to like just like whatever my project bundle is to just 
use GitHub so that nothing is missed, missed and it all goes. Um, um, it's like if I'm doing Aditi can just uh, download all of that and then clone that and then see if something is missing. And if and then she can check for all if I'm doing the best practices, if I have hard coded file name, um, file directories and stuff, then she would change that and then I could uh, make those edits. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, I hope I know we, uh, we have answered your question. Um, the next question is, did you run into memory issues when storing all the air quality data in the laptop? Also, since the analysis can be replicated all around the world, have you uh, thought of turning your analysis into a package? Um, for this, I would invite Aditi to answer the question. Aditi, that's okay because that work is led by you. Uh, yes, so uh, we did run into memory issues, uh, but not with data, but just by when we analyze a lot of data, I did run into uh, memory issues. But then I also learned about pattern processing. So I would keep all my course running for this uh, mega work happening in my R studio. And uh, so that is the first part of the question. And the second part, we have not thought about making it into a package. It never occurred to us, but then I'm sure uh, we can definitely give it a try. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. That's a good uh, initiative. Yeah, I hope we answered your question. Uh, okay. Um, the next question is, um, I wonder if R is fast enough for data analysis in your case. I think you're dealing with big data. Uh, do you use R in a cluster or on a single PC? Um, I think that was something similar. And yeah, um, and actually, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, no, I think uh, you answered that. Um, the next question is, could you please explain a bit what the here package does? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, if you just uh, down download the library here, like the here, here package, um, you will get, as, so as soon as you download that, you'll get a message that here starts from your current di directory. So here basically encapsulates what your current directory is. So if you're using it on a different uh, machine, uh, it will it will encapsulate, encapsulate that. So ba uh, basically here makes the starting point um, of your directory as, as your current directory. And then from there, I can write that in this folder, my um, file uh, my file is like within data within i have data and then i have raw and in that there is my file name so i can just say here um in within brackets data raw here so as long as i'm then if i transfer the same bundle like if i upload, uh, upload it on github and someone downloads it it doesn't matter where on the directory their file where in their computer the file is because when they use here and then again, the path starts from here, which is their current directory, and from data and raw and the uh, file name. Um, I hope I, I hope that vocal um, <laughs> explanation was uh, uh, useful. Yes. Uh, so the next question is: Tidy models is a great tool for quickly trying different model classes. But the gains in the model performance are often yeah. marginal at best. What are your expectations from that tool? Oh, that's uh, thank you, thank you for that information. I didn't know that. Um, I think it is just because we are working in tidy words and just like having a sort of streamlined way of doing modeling is something that we like to learn and. Um, uh, so that's that's just like a different way of writing code um, in the tidy verse or like the tidy tidy way of doing this. So that's that's why it's it's on our list. Okay, so there's one more question. Uh, do you need to update the shiny code for cleaning data? Uh, Aditi, do you want to answer that? Uh, right now, we don't have to update any shiny code, uh, but you can definitely um, uh, pull, pull a request in the GitHub repo if you want any more features of cleaning data to be added. Right now, it has a few specified cleaning options already inside the application. Yeah, I hope uh, I, I was able to explain it clearly. Anything to add, Vinakshi? 
Uh, no, I, I think that's that's good. Uh, yes, we have one more question. Do you think there are enough tutorials uh, for going from beginner to intermediate R user, or do you see some gaps? So, um, I feel like I have gone from beginner to intermediate R um, just using online resources. Maybe, maybe not necessarily tutorials, but what have helped are the book clubs. So R for data science book clubs or advanced R book clubs like within the R community. So being part of those book clubs, so it's more active learning rather than following tutorials. And, and I think once you start using R, then you're getting, you get better at asking the right question. So again, it's like you get yourself in the data, um, like this is a question I need to solve. I know this much beginner R, and then um, I can do these things um, to become uh, for intermediate R. Also something that has helped is just reading other people's code. So that's why I just love Tidy Tuesday and you know, the um, there are screencasts um, by so, so, so many people that are helpful, not just for visualization, but also for tidy modeling. Um, so uh, I, I, I do feel like there are enough resources, not maybe not in form of tutorials, but if not in form of tutorials, many other ways to go from beginner to intermediate. Okay, uh, thank you. There's one last question which will be taken. Um, um, so Ashish says, I'm working on geographical weighted depression. Can your research help in my subject? Hmm. I actually don't know. Aditi, are you familiar with that? Uh, uh, I have seen um, uh, graphical, uh, sorry, geographical weighted regression happening in for uh, land use regression models or another type of land use regression models. But uh, you can definitely uh, get in touch with us. Uh, what you say, and actually, we can definitely. Yeah, and and you know, um, the link to our GitHub profiles is uh, uh, are there like online on Twitter. So just like definitely get in touch. We are getting into land use regression soon. So, you know, maybe, maybe there's something that will be helpful for you. Yeah. Um, can I add just one more question? So, uh, what did you use before uh, there was an alternative to R markdown? How did you get around that? Before, before R markdown. So before R markdown, um, I would just like share share my code, like the dot R file, and if anyone asked for it, because most of the time it was not needed, like unless unless the collaborator is another co a person who is actively coding, they are not asking for it. So it's um, really just Word, like Word doc or Google docs or Power presentation. So it's, it's like what I'm able to share is only outputs. Um, we still do that. Uh, we still do that, and it's it's still useful to share with a larger com uh, like with a larger set of collaborators who really uh, who are like this doing higher level of at a higher level of decision making where um, maybe they are not coding and um, or they just want to look at the results. So what helps? In Google Docs is what we can't do in our markdown yet, or, or uh, is is like this this real time commenting. So if or um, I want to say that even if someone is looking at in a time inconsistent way, they can leave their comments and then you can come back and um, address them. So for such functionalities, we still use Google Docs in a combination of. Um, our markdown, but just the, with the HTML reports and with the interactive plots, it's just so much more information that we can communicate. So now um, I think a hybrid of both is what we are trying, we just, we are doing and it it works depending on the, who who we are communicating with. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much again, Manakshi, for the very interesting and engaging keynote. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, please keep the discussion and questions going on in the Slack. There is a channel key underscore Kushwaha. And uh, uh, due to the break, we want to again thank our studio, uh, the sponsor of the day. And the next session will be in 15 minutes on these tracks. And see you all again. Enjoy with us.